I now have the great pleasure of introducing you to the leading scholar of police legitimacy in this country. Tracy Mears, who is the Walton Hale Hamilton Professor at Yale Law School, and I met in uh, Chicago in the 90s when I was writing a piece for The New Yorker about a new theory of law enforcement that she and a few colleagues had come up with called the social norms theory. And Tracy realized that people obey the law when they trust the legitimacy of the authorities that are enforcing it. And she has gone on to be a member of the President's Task Force on Policing in the 21st Century, which President Obama uh, formed after the Urban Spring. That uh, commission, which Connie Rice also served on, issued its report in May. And that report embraces your central conclusions, which is that, indeed, legitimacy is crucial. And you begin this report by a paradox, which is that violence across the country overall is going down. People recognize that the police are responsible for violence going down. And at the same time, they don't trust the police. Trust in the police is flat. And uh, why is that the case? Well, I, is this on? It, I think the reason is um, based in a lot of the things that you've actually heard today, right? So. Um, I'm going to be so much more boring than the other people who've gone before me. I'm sorry. Um, but I do hope that some of the research that I'll talk about today will help to motivate um, us to seriously think about real policies that can change the way policing is done, to generalize some of the ideas that Connie was talking about today, and also to make maybe less difficult, I don't want to make it sound like it's, it's easy at all, but less difficult the, the problem that um, Clifton Kinney was talking about. So um, here's what the research says. The research says that what people care about when they are rating folks in legal authority, so for purposes of our discussion, we're going to call that police, um, they care much more about how they're treated by police than how pol effective police are or um, they care more about how they're treated than whether the decisions of police um, favor them or not. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't care about those kinds of things. It would be silly to say that people don't care about how effective police are. It would be silly to say that people don't care whether or not they get a ticket or not, right? The point is, is that it matters to you if you get a fine or a ticket from police. Uh, from a police officer, how that police officer is treating you in the transaction, right? And so if you end up not getting a ticket uh, when you're pulled over and the police officer treats you entirely with disrespect and does all kinds of negative things to you in the way that um, Clifton was talking about, then that matters to you. So here are the four things that research tell us that matters. People care about treated, being treated with dignity and respect. They care about being able to assess whether the decisions of a legal authority is fair, grounded in fact, is transparent. So if you think about a police stop, it matters to a person that they're told why they were stopped by the police, for example. People care about having input into a decision by a legal authority. So if you're thinking about the kind of strategies that Connie was just talking about, it matters to people that they have a role to play in developing those strategies. And in a particular interaction, let's say when you're pulled over by a cop, it matters to you to be able to tell your side of the story. And research tells us that this matters even when it doesn't make a difference to the outcome. And then last, people are looking for ways to assess whether a person of legal authority over them can be trusted to treat them benevolently in the future. So one way of thinking about that is to think if you're a person who has never had an interaction with a police officer, but the people that you know, people in your family, people in your neighborhood, your friends, have had negative interactions, then it's unlikely that you are going to expect that person to treat you benevolently in the future. Those four factors together are called procedural justice. And the research also shows that when um, legal authorities act in ways that are consistent with procedural justice, it, people are willing to confer legitimacy, trust, and the like in um, police and other legal authority. That's the research in a nutshell. And give us specific examples of cities or police departments that have implemented these principles successfully. Well, so one way of thinking about it is that there are different ways to do it. So I could describe 
what Connie was talking about and the housing authority in LA as a way of doing this, right? And one way they did that is by changing the incentive structure. They didn't say that crime reduction was self-justifying. What they said was, we are going to evaluate you based on whether you do things that increase trust, whether you make fewer rather than more arrests, whether um, people are willing, people in the community are willing to work with you. All of those things are consistent with this theory. Um, I've seen examples of it in Newark. Um, I've seen examples of it in Chicago where Gary McCarthy has spent a lot of time training every police officer in the city of Chicago consistent with these ideas. So there are different manifestations of it. In fact, the ceasefire idea that you were talking about, depending on how it's done, um, can be done in that way. Right? I think the key to it is understanding that there can be costs to aggressive policing for the sake of crime reduction without thinking about the potential impact that can have on public trust. Tell us about the three elements that ceasefire-like interactions between communities and the police have, because it's a very interesting way of generalizing these lessons. Oh, you mean the structure of the, the structure. meeting? How do you it's have like the meeting? Yeah. It's yeah. like, this is a quiz. No. I give the exams here. <laughs> you, told, you taught me this stuff. <laughs> I can't believe I remember it 20 years later. But. Okay. You came up with this great idea of bringing offenders and the, folk, and the police together. Right. And you told me that there have to be three elements to these meetings. Uh, so I didn't. The thing that uh, the, the program that I actually developed in Chicago was based on David Kennedy's work in Boston. So that was Boston Ceasefire. And what the, those meetings have three parts. First, um, law enforcement community tells, well, let's back up. The people in the room are potential offenders basically, and sometimes they're family members, sometimes not, um, and members of law enforcement, members of a sort of service provider community, um, and importantly, someone who used to be involved in criminal offending and has changed their life around, right? So the first part of the meeting is explaining to folks in a very dispassionate way, um, <coughs> these are the consequences of future offending. Um, the legal consequences. The second part is having a person say, I changed my life, you can change it too. You can change yours too. And the third part is service provision about we're here to help. Now it's interesting, um, the mayors who were speaking before, I think it was Mayor Walsh, I don't know if he's still in here. Um, he said, well, ceasefire is much more about violence reduction. It's not so much about you know addressing these issues of race. It's not directly about um, issues of uh, procedural justice and legitimacy, and I agree. Uh, the point is, is when you are engaged in that process, if you're trying to address violence reduction in that way, as opposed to, let's say, what New York did, going out and stopping and frisking hundreds and thousands of people for the sake of getting guns that they never got, right? It's a strategy that that is would is obviously. Um, more likely to be perceived as legitimate by the community than that approach. So I think that's the way I would put it. You note that violence is going down. Is police violence going down or is it up or stable? That's an interesting question. I think the best estimate, um, so first, we don't actually count and assess um, police shootings. That was one uh, in a systematic way. That was one of the re recommendations of um, the president's task force. Um, that said, um, there has been data gathered on police shootings, police fatalities in particular in major cities over time. And if you look at that data, um, which does have some problems associated with it, um, if you look at that data, I think it's fair to say that the number of police fatalities um, has gone down. However, it is also true that we are at extremely high levels compared to any other you know, country, and these shootings are so much more salient than they were before because of social media. So we're, paid, we're paying attention to it in a way that we never have. It's not, it's not the invisible number, it's not the mystery number, it's not the problem that no one knows about anymore. The President's Commission made recommendations about the use of social media, and it was really interesting to hear the mayor say they're releasing videos right away. How can social media be used to increase trust rather than decrease it? Wow. I mean, 
I have to admit that that is not a, a question that I have thought seriously about. Um, here's what I can say, that as we are paying attention to these incidents, and as they become more salient, I would say that one way social media can help us to, main, uh, to build trust and maintain trust is to um, ensure that we don't let go of this moment, right? This is a moment in time. It's, 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 it's an, a critical, pivotal moment in history, I think. Um, yesterday, someone was talking about the potential for another reconstruction, right? Um, and if we see this as, you know, the third reconstruction, you were talking about, you know, the, the sp spring, um, then that in that way, I think social media, following what youth are doing, following their lead, um, paying attention to the protests, paying attention to the arguments that people are making, and understanding it in the context of what people care about, right? Which is not that safety is just a matter of crime reduction, Right? Safety is a matter of your p security. I'm going to use that term. Security is a matter of the relationship of the public to the state. This is the 150th anniversary of the 13th Amendment, which Clifton Kenny mentioned. And he also, next year is the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment after the Civil War. Clifton mentioned how those amendments were subverted after the Civil War by things like the Black Codes, which denied African Americans the right to make contracts and to be full citizens. What in the president's task force are the central recommendations that could be the basis for a third reconstruction. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> Just light questions here in Aspen on a. Uh... Let me start small and try to build, okay? okay. Um, and the, uh, where I wanna start is this idea that crime reduction is not self-justifying, okay? Um, in order for us to have a change of mindset, a change of culture, right, policing agencies need to understand that while they contribute to public safety, that any aggressive strategy that they under, uh, undertake is not a warrant for itself, right? And that's in part what this procedural justice idea is about. Right? So when you understand that at its essence, legitimacy is about a citizen looking at a legal authority and saying, I want you to treat me as someone who counts in your eyes. And everything you do has to demonstrate that to me, right? Then you understand that what this is really about is understanding the terms of citizenship in a very real way. And we haven't actually ever really done it, right? We haven't really done it. That's Clifton's point, I think. So that's the terms, um, I think. Right, of the third reconstruction, if I can have like 10 seconds. Yes, you may. Right? If you look at the 14th Amendment, the 13th Amendment, the Constitution, right, that is a formal curriculum of citizenship. It tells us who we are and how we value freedoms of all individuals. But the reality is, if we're talking about policing, how police treat people in public, especially in the neighborhoods that Clifton was talking about, is a hidden curriculum. It's a hidden curriculum that is inconsistent with that formal curriculum, and everything that he's describing that police do is actually inconsistent with that formal curriculum. And so when those two clash, right, you have a sense of who the citizen is. The citizen is the one who's treated consistent with the formal curriculum, and the anti-citizen is the one who is not treated in that way. And until we have a system in which the formal curriculum and the hidden curriculum are the same for everybody, because I guarantee you the hidden curriculum is right for all of you sitting here, right? How police treat you is the way the formal curriculum says they should treat you. Then we will have achieved the goal of the third reconstruction. Beautiful. Like nice. Very nice. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this